Hi folks, my name is Michael Taffel, and I'm right outside the old city walls of the city of Florence here. Now I like to come to Florence every year to visit friends, to give a few lectures, to eat the food, and yes, to see all the sights. But I also like to come here to study the Florentine Republic that existed about, from about the 1100s to about the 1530s. Florence during this time was one of the most powerful cities in Europe. It was on the cutting edge of culture. It was the epicenter of the Italian Renaissance. But it was a republic, which means it did not have a king. Now, as someone who's taught a lot of world history, one of the things that I've noticed is throughout human history, civilizations tend to be ruled by monarchs, whether they're called emperors, empresses, kings, queens, chiefs, some sort of alpha figure at the top, a dictator per se. The idea of having shared power is actually very rare in history. Only until recent times has it become more normal. Now, the Florentine Republic was by mo no means a perfect republic. Not everybody was represented. It really only represented uh, the male guild members of the various trades, like the blacksmiths and the wool merchants and the bankers and those types of things. But nevertheless, it was a type of government that didn't have a king. Now, there's been a lot of research done on the rise and fall of the Roman Republic. The Roman Republic, as you may know, collapses in the first century BCE and it, become, it gets replaced by the Caesars, the military dictators. Eventually, something similar is going to happen here in Florence as well, where the Medici Dukes are going to take power and the idea of the Republic goes away. Now, republics and democracies are very, very fragile. Once they collapse, it's very difficult to bring them back. So what I want to do with this small documentary is try to learn why the Florentine Republic fails, and maybe we can gain some insight or some wisdom that can help us with the present and with the future. So hopefully folks will come along and join me on this journey, and we'll take in some of the sights as well. Let's go. Folks, if we were to come to Florence back in the year 1200, the city would be almost unrecognizable. Many of the famous landmarks that tourists come to visit today, like the Palazzo Vecchio or the Duomo, weren't even built yet. But one distinguishing characteristic of the city was large towers everywhere you look. Now, some of these towers are still with us today, but many have been torn down over the years. But the towers were owned by the powerful families. In the 1200s, powerful feudal families dominated Florentine politics. Many of them had their wealthy base out in the countryside with their vast estates and their large lands. But when they moved to the city, they built these magnificent towers as a way of, yes, watching over the city, but also as a way of kind of creating more living space for themselves and their families, very similar to the modern skyscraper. But right around the mid-1200s, that's all going to begin to change. Now, I found an amazing passage from the historian Kenneth Bartlett out of this book, Florence in the Age of Savonarola and the Medici. Now, I'm going to read directly because what he pinpoints here is the way the city transforms during the 1200s. So read along with me. Between 1293 and 1350, the urban character of the city had changed dramatically. What had been at the end of the 13th century a city of spiky, noble towers, symbolizing public power and private hands, Florence had become by the mid-14th century a grand metropolis identified by the public towers of the community, the collective of citizens active in the Republic. Some towers represented the city as a polis, the towers on the Palazzo della Signoria or on the Bargello. Others represented the Christian community, so closely linked with the idea of citizenship the bell tower of Giotto on the cathedral, the spires of the Badia di Firenze, and other churches. The message was now clear. Public power now resided in collective public hands, operating through the Guild Republic, a republic able to withstand the challenges of the nobles, plague, financial collapse, and political factionalism. So what he pinpoints here is a moment when those towers started coming down and the new towers represented the collective of the Republic. And I think that's so amazing. If we look at the Palazzo Vecchio today, that's a public building. It's still where the city government of Florence operates out of. The church, another public building. But like I said earlier, if we went back to the 1200s, we would see a 
city, a skyline dominated by towers, towers that represented noble rule, not rule of the people. Folks, if we're ever going to get to the bottom of why the Florentine Republic failed, I think one of the best things to do is get to know some of its people. I stumbled upon this chronicle here by Dino Campagni, who was writing around the year 1300. Now, poor Dino got stuck on the wrong side of politics. His political party got ousted. They lost. So, he wasn't exiled from the city like Dante or Petrarch's father, but he was exiled from politics, which means he was out of the loop. He couldn't run for office anymore. All he could do was live out his life in obscurity and tend to his business. However, after about 10 years, Dino felt compelled to get his side of the story down on paper. And here we have this 700 years later, we can get a bird's eye view into some of the problems that the Florentine Republic was facing. Now, just to give you a sense of perspective here, he was writing in the year 1300, about 200 years before Machiavelli. And he talks quite a bit about factional strife. Now, I want to share with you just a couple passages from his work here. First off, in the introduction, he states that he put off writing for a number of years. But since these perils and noteworthy events have so multiplied that they can no longer be left in silence, I now intend to write for the benefit of those who will inherit more fortunate times. So he's writing for us, for the later generations. But what he talks about here, as he sets the stage in the first couple pages, is factionalism. And factionalism and factional strife is something that all republics and democracies suffer from. Sometimes it gets violent, as in the case of Florence. But just to give you a little insight here, to continue on, I'm on page two of his chronicle. He states, May its citizens, Florence's citizens, may its citizens then weep for themselves and for their children, since by their pride and ill will and competition for office they have undone so noble a city, and abused its laws, and sold off in a moment the honors which their ancestors had acquired with great effort over many years. After many ancient evils resulting from the strife of its citizens, there arose in this city a new evil which divided all of its citizens in such a way that the two factions called themselves enemies under two new names, that is, Guelph and Ghibelline. Now, when we study the early years of the Florentine Republic in the 1200s, these are the two big political parties everybody's talking about. Now, Florence is not an independent state. It's part of a larger political entity called the Holy Roman Empire, which includes much of what would be present-day Germany and northern Italy. Now, during the 1200s, there's kind of a, a political fight between the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor over who has more power within the empire. Now, this is not a very unified empire. It's a very decentralized place. But it caused all the city-states, especially in Italy, to have to choose sides. So political parties emerged. If you were a Guelph, you were a supporter of the Pope. If you were a Ghibelline, you were the supporter of the Emperor. All of a sudden, however, the Guelphs are going to become triumphant, and they're going to kick out the Ghibellines, and then the Guelphs themselves split into two new political parties, the White Guelphs and the Black Guelphs. Dino was part of the White Guelphs, and those guys lost to the Black Guelphs. But then once the Black Guelphs take power, then they begin to split as well. So, without being too confusing, one of the insights we can gain from Dino's chronicle here is, yes, Florence suffered from a lot of factional strife, but even once one faction becomes victorious, then they too begin to split. And this brings up a question I want to ask you, the audience, the viewer, is, is this just innate in human nature? That we just love to divide ourselves up into groups, Democrat, Republican, Christian, Protestant, Sunni, Shia. It seems like when I study history, there's always factions. 
And republics and democracies almost encourage factions in such a way because citizens have political power. Now you can get a little bit of factionalism within kingdoms or empires or things like that, but for the most part everybody rallies around the king because there's that certain fear of this person who has all the power, who's the absolute leader, the absolute king or whatnot. But Dino is offer, offering us some very interesting insight into the 1200s. Now remember, the Florentine Republic does not fail until about the 1500s, and we're going to mull about here in the 1200s as we go into our next narrative shortly. So for now, Dino is going to be one of our companions on this journey. You know, something interesting begins to happen in the late 1200s, and that is we have all these noble families dominating Florence, but the nobility, the powerful families, they only account for about 5% of the population. So what the hell is everybody else doing? Well, the late 1200s becomes the age of il popolo, the people. Now, as these powerful feudal families and powerful magnates fight for control over Florence, whether it be Guelphs or Ghibellines, eventually what they have to do is start tapping into the people, whether it be for financial resources, more taxes, or even boots on the ground. Now, originally, they start giving rights to people in the higher professions, things like the bankers, the wool merchants, the silk merchants. They start to get representation in what is called a priorate, where the members of each guild select one of their own who represent their interests in the overall government. However, as the 1200s continue on, once we get to the 1280s, we start to see a middle sector of guilds beginning to gain power. These folks might be individuals like, uh, you know, wine sellers, armor makers, innkeepers, those types of characters. And eventually, by the end of the 1290s, we see almost 21 guilds represented from innkeepers, bakers, butchers, all the way up to the bankers and silk, silk workers. Now this government in Florence is called the Priorate, and it consists of 21 guilds. However, from reading Dino's uh, chronicle, he mentions almost 70 different guilds, so it's still not representative of all the various guilds in Florence. Now you might ask the question, what is a guild? Well, in the most simplistic way, Think of all of the members of the same profession in a particular city in medieval times bonding together for collective interests. Not like a union where the workers get together to kind of have leverage against the owners. This is, let, let, let me use this example. Let's say we're the blacksmiths of Florence. The blacksmiths of Florence, if you want to set up a blacksmith shop, you have to have membership into the guild. Remember folks, before they had mechanical clocks, the church bells in these medieval European cities is how people knew time. Anyway, let me just finish here. So the blacksmiths would all join a guild and that way they could collectively protect, protect their interests. Because the last thing you want if you own a blacksmith shop in Florence is to have some outsider come in from a different city, set up shop and start charging cheaper prices or offering cheaper products. So this way the members of the guild had a legal right to ice people, to keep them out of the profession. If you wanted to become a blacksmith in Florence, you had to go through the proper channels. So, of those guilds, think of them as kind of fraternal organizations based on a trade, they would select one of their own, usually the most powerful of them, to sit on the city government. So when we call Florence's government in the late 1200s the Priorate, it's 21 members, 
all of individual guilds, the head of the blacksmiths, the head of the wool merchants, the head of the silk merchants, etc., etc. In 1293, they passed the famous, famous Ordinances of Justice, which kind of solidifies this new style of republic government where the people matter. However, there is a problem. Although Il Popolo have now gained a lot of power in the Florentine government, amongst Il Popolo, there's a lot of differences. Some guilds matter more than others. Obviously, the bankers in the wool merchants, the bankers with all the money, the wool merchants who employ a big chunk of the city, they feel that their industry is more important. So they have more leverage in the government than, say, the wine sellers or the bakers. So not all Il Popolo are represented equally in this Florentine government. However, compar compared to a traditional monarchy or the traditional feudal system, this form of government does allow for more and more, um, more, and more representation of the people. So by the late 1200s, we start to see all of the elements of the Florentine Republic coming into play. You know, one thing I can't stop getting a kick out of being a visitor to Florence in the 21st century is just how violent of a city this was back in Renaissance and medieval times. Nowadays, you wouldn't even guess it. People come from all over the world to visit the great art galleries, to see the buildings, to eat the food. It's a generally safe city. People are walking the streets all hours of the night, drinking, reveling. But if we were to go back in time, to the time of Dino, the 1300s, this was a very violent place. Now, it did have periods of peace, but when it comes to the factional fighting between Guelphs and Ghibellines, there would be fighting in the streets, armed bands of people, each representing the sides, going at it, right in front of the general populace. You would have targeted assassinations. You would have, you know, petty street crime as well. So this was a much different place. Now, today, when we think of Guelph and Ghibelline, most people don't even know what those terms mean. We have restaurants named after the Guelphs and Ghibellines, hotels named after the Guelphs. We even have streets via Ghibellina, via Guelph. So it's kind of celebrated almost like how people celebrate mascots, just old relics of the history. Now, one thing I find very interesting, and I got this from reading Dino, is that all of this factional violence wasn't as much about ideology as it was about power. It wasn't about their devotion to the Pope necessarily or the Emperor or vice versa. It was all about competition for office. Eliminating your enemies meant you now have a monopoly on office. So, what does that mean? It means you can raise taxes, you have the power of the purse, you can raise armies, you're in charge of the justice system. You have all of this power, you can use it for personal means. Now, this should not be surprising. You study any political society from modern times all the way back to ancient Rome, and you're going to see people use politics for their own personal advantage. But one point I wanted to make clear here is just remember, if you visit Florence, just how different of a place it was back in these times. Much, much more violence, and the violence was also related to politics. One thing that's sure to destabilize a republic is a good old-fashioned war or economic depression. And that's exactly what's going to happen to Florence here in the 1370s. Florence is going to go to war with the papacy. Now, you might ask, well, how does, how does a country go to war with the papacy? Well, back in the 1300s, the popes ruled over a territory in central Italy called the Papal States. But 
Just to take things back a bit further, in the early 1300s, the popes fled Rome and began ruling from Avignon, a city just south of France. During this time, the city of Rome essentially went up for grabs. It was ripped apart by gang warfare, things like that. And Florence seized the moment and gained more and more influence over the papal states and its varying cities. Now, in the 1370s, when the popes are declaring that they're coming back to Rome, one of the conditions is they want to get their power back in the, in the papal states. And that is going to take away some power from Florence, hence why the war begins. But fighting the papacy is not like fighting any other power. It's not like fighting the King of France or the Duke of Milan. The Pope has spiritual power over all the Catholics in Europe. So one of the first things the Pope is going to do is excommunicate the city of Florence. Shortly after that, it's going to issue decrees throughout Europe saying nobody is allowed to trade with the Florentines. So taking the first one, the excommunication, that's going to have a massive psychological effect upon the Florentines because now the Florentines can't go to mass. They can't administer the, the priests cannot administer the sacraments. People cannot receive communion, go to confession, those types of things. But the economic play that the Pope does by issuing this decree throughout Europe that nobody's allowed to do business with the Florentines, that's going to start to set the Florentine economy into a downward spiral. Now, <clears throat> to be fair, some countries and some principalities do continue to do business with the Florentines, but let's just say half of Europe stops doing business with the Florentines. That's a huge bite out of their economy. And what happens? It's like a domino effect. You have to start laying workers off. All of a sudden, you don't need 5,000 more workers here, 3,000 workers there. This is going to cause anger on the streets. Now, leading up to this war, and the war is called the War of the Eight Saints, or the War of the Otto Sancti, takes place between 1375 and 1378. Leading up to this, Il Popolo, as we mentioned in our last segment, the people are becoming more and more of a political force in Florence. They're the lifeblood of, blood of the economy, the chumpy. The chumpy are the folks that comb the wool all day. This is an exhausting, unskilled job, but is essential to the wool industry, which is so big in Florence. Many of them get hit the hardest. So in 1378, we see the Chumpy Revolt beginning, and that's going to be a massive uprising of about 10,000 people in Florence demanding more rights, more representation in the government, and it's going to cause for a lot of economic uh, turmoil as well as a lot of political turmoil as well. But Florence has a few cards to play here. It starts to send its agents into the Papal States, sending them to the various major cities like Bologna, telling them to resist the tyranny of Papal rule in honor of their ancient liberties. A lot of this rhetoric is being pumped out, pumped out of Florence by a man named Colocio Salutati. He's a humanist. He's well versed in the ancient literature of ancient Rome. And a lot of these small city-state republics in, uh, in Italy look to the Roman Republic for their inspiration. So a lot of this is going out. Their attempt is we want to destabilize the Papal States even more, make this difficult for the Pope. But while all this is going on in the war, now Florence has to deal with this massive uprising. And as I just mentioned, it's about 10,000 people rising up. This is going to put a lot of strain on the system, and in all of this chaos is going to emerge a strong man, Michele di Lando. He used to work in the wool industry, he must have had some natural charisma about him, but he rises up as the leader of this new revolt. So the Florentine government has to take him seriously. So one of the demands of this uprising is that there's going to be more guild representation. Three new guilds are created, a guild for the poor, a guild for the Chompy, and these guilds are now supposed to be seen as equal as the old classic guilds of Florence, like the wool merchants or the bankers, and that's going to cause for a lot of elitism. A lot of these folks who are part of the Florentine establishment, they don't want to sit in the same room, share the same roof with some of these people that are uneducated, uh, work unskilled jobs, that sort of thing. But this leaves us to about 1378, folks, where all of a sudden Florence starts to destabilize. And there's just a couple of lessons to take here before we end part one. That with things like internal chaos of a city, civil unrest, we start to see the emergence of strongmen. In this case, Michele di Lando. But after they end up buying off Michele di Lando and they essentially crush 
the demands of the Chompy Revolt. What we're going to see in the next stage of Florentine history is what we call the Age of Oligarchy, where strong, powerful families are going to begin to dominate Florentine politics. The first one being the Albizzi oligarchy, which lasts from the end of the Chumpy Revolt, 1378, all the way to the 1420s. In the next big family to dominate Florentine history, all the way up to the end of the Republic, is going to be the Medici family. So that's where we're going to begin in part two. So I really appreciate you spending time, folks, watching this little documentary, looking at some of the scenery here in Florence, and I hope I see you for part two. Thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Thank you.